Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Soulful Hunter podcast. I'm your host, Johnny Mack. Through this podcast, I'm on a mission to transform lives through primal adventure and to spread my mission of mentorship is conservation. This podcast is powered by Washington Backcountry, a resource for all hunters, both new and old. To find out more about Washington Backcountry, go to wabackcountry.com or search for Washington Backcountry on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. The Soulful Hunter podcast is also proudly presented by the Crazy Elk Company. Based out of the state of Washington with products made in America, they are providing solutions with gear to problems you didn't even know you had. Their tag wall is one of those solutions, and I had the pleasure of using it on all of my hunts this last year, and it is now a mainstay in my kill kit. The tag wall is a water-resistant zippered pouch that comes with its own reusable zip ties to safely and securely store your notch tag for quick and easy access. For more information, go to crazyelkcompany.com and use the code SOULFUL with a capital S to save 20% at checkout. Be blessed, everyone, and as always, stay soulful. This podcast is also proudly brought to you by Onyx Hunt. When I first got into hunting, I kept hearing all about public land and different access and how to find different locations to hunt. I was like, well, how are people even identifying all this stuff? Well, sure enough, I came across the number one hunting GPS app, and that is Onyx Hunt. If you guys want to want to get better at hunting and, and go deeper into your scouting, Onyx Hunt is the number one GPS app for that. Join the millions of hunters who trust Onyx Hunt to find more game, discover new access, and hunt smarter. It was a game changer for me, and I know it's going to be a game changer for you if you've never used it. If you have used it, you know the power that it holds. Guys, I really hope you enjoy this episode. If you want to know more about Onyx, go to onyxmaps.com forward slash hunt and check out their app. Be blessed, freedom on, and stay soulful. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the Soulful Hunter Podcast. I'm your host, Johnny Mack, and today I'm joined by a good buddy of mine who, someone who I have yet to actually shake your hand, but we've connected through social media and we have fellow uh, common bonds through Matt Schmitz and Inferno Archery. Shout out to Schmitty out there. Schmitty. Yeah. Corey Daniels from Dead Nuts Outdoors. Corey, how you doing, brother? Doing great, man. Thanks for having me on. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure. It is so much fun podcasting, as you know, because you're looking at maybe starting your own it opens so many doors. You have so many conversations with people that you would never like normally just interact with. It's phenomenal. It's amazing. It gives you a chance to to talk to people um, in our field and learn things. And, you know, we're all hunters. We all think we know it all. And then we meet somebody who's better, bigger, smarter, faster, whatever they're, they're better than us. And I love, I love that part of it is, is getting to know other, other ways to get better in the woods and, and, uh, and, and then also sharing some of the knowledge that, that I may have that can work for them. So Yeah, it is always wild. Um, dude, learning, it never stops, right? Now, you, not too long ago, were on uh, Jim Huntsman's podcast. Yeah, what a guy, man. He's well, awesome. I love Jim. Cool dude. He's a great dude, and he's a great advocate for us, too. He's not afraid to fire up. He's he gets after it and, and talks about things that we all need to be talking about. So Yeah. Now, how did you and Jim get connected? Uh, I met him at the, well, he'd reached out to me and then I was at the Bighorn show in Spokane, Washington. And, uh, we met up there and shook hands and said hello and set a time to get together and kind of to talk about, you know, we have common friends as well. I believe that you're friends with as well in, in Tony Wintrip and it's kind of took off, you know, this, this industry is so big, but yet so small that, uh, if you talk long enough, you'll end up knowing half the damn half the same people, you know, so. right. Ain't that the truth? It is a small world in the hunting industry. Uh, what's really interesting, Corey, is the state of Washington gets a lot of hate for the way it is in regards to fish and wildlife management, you know, politics, all this stuff. But at the end of the day, there are a lot of under the radar hunters and hunting in the state of Washington. And you, my friend, are one of those big dogs that, doesn't like to toot their own horn and is very humble and runs with that humility. But what, what do you think about the state of Washington? There's some slayers, some killers up here. There's real killers. <clears throat> the West coast in general. I mean, you look at a lot of the podcasts and a lot of the very successful guys are from Oregon and Washington and they're traveling to these, 
you know, the, the, the big, the Western hunting areas, you know, where everybody wants to go, uh, Montana, Colorado, Wyoming, Utah, and they're finding success there. When you hunt these coastal communities, um, like Wyoming, Colorado, Idaho, Montana is my favorite place. They bring their own challenges without a doubt. And, and it's different hunting. When you hunt on the coast, you hunt in climates and, and it's such a wet and brushy atmosphere. You, it's just, it's just different hunting, but I think it prepares you very well for just going East one state or East two states. And, uh, it's the ro Rosies are tough. They're, they're bit, and when they're on the ground, the work even gets tougher. Because they're, of how huge. They are. they're huge. They're huge. It, yeah, it people, a lot of fun. people don't realize like how massive they are. You walk up on them. You're like, dude, just lift a, lifting a leg is, is a, a struggle. You know? Yeah. Sometimes they, they can look like a short school bus with antlers for sure. They're, they are, <laughs> they're giants. So Corey, what, let's, let's back it up here. What's your history? Where did hunting begin for you? Were you raised a hunter? Was it something that you just like had a call upon your soul? Where did you find yourself in this world uh, of being a hunter? Oh man. Uh, started when I was a little guy, um, getting to go with my family, my grandpa, my uncles, to Monument, Oregon, and just just be in camp and and experience that it was always mule deer hunting. We never elk hunted as a kid. In fact, I didn't start elk hunting till I was thirty years old. Um, I grew up blacktail hunting, and we blacktail hunted. And if we drew a special tag in Oregon, we could mule deer hunt. Uh, but my uncle Greg was my best friend in the whole world, and he took me all the time blacktail hunting. If I was ever close to him, I could go stay at his house, and he'd take me hunting um, in the fields of the Willamette Valley. Uh, little timber patches. Sometimes I get in some timber and I just was bla a blacktail hunter. Uh, when I moved to Washington, uh, I, I got married to my best friend, my wife, Kelly, and, and uh, she lived in an area where there was a lot of elk. And I was like, holy, that'd be pretty dang awesome to hunt. And was immediately, you know, thinking I was a pretty good hunter, was immediately humbled um, <laughs> with just how something that big could get away so fast without making a sound, um, thinking I knew what I was doing. At the time, I was just learning how to call. Again, I was 30 years old. Uh, I was just learning how to call. I'd never bow hunted, so I was rifle hunting in the beginning. And I was able to harvest a couple bulls with a rifle. Um, but I really enjoyed uh, getting out in the field with elk and, and learning uh, their habits and what they do, uh, finding cows and how they, you know, right when they start calving, where are they going to be? Go see how they treat their calves. Go learn when the bulls are coming in and why they're coming in and how many are coming in and just learning habits and hanging out with them. And as I started to learn that, I started to find more success. Um, I was able to take some people in the beginning out hunting and I learned how to call using berry game calls in the beginning. Um, I'm a Phelpsy now, but anyway, uh, you're not one you know, of those learning... guys that blows Phelps, are you? <laughs> well, yeah, I blow Phelps. So, um, and I really, you know, I, I get, if it, if it sounds good, I'm going to blow it. I'm not, I'm not with anybody right now, but I just want to, if I can win, if I can win, you're getting blown. Talk about so, marketing right there. Jeez Louise. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Keep going. I'm sorry. Dude. He's a great dude. That, that, but they all seem to be good guys. There's, there's a lot of calls out there now where they're good dudes. Jason's yeah. an awesome guy. I pulled but, you, I pulled you off your topic. So you're talking about you're calling berry, berry calls and you're taking people out there. Yeah. So you're getting better at calling. Well, Barry was the call that you, you know, just about, you couldn't screw it up. I mean, it was almost impossible with their bugle tube. And that's how I learned and getting them to respond is how I started to learn to call. And I'm a real competitive guy. And I meet this Tony Winter guy and he, he pushes me, even though we have never hunted together. He pushes me. Um, I see his successes, our friend Matt Schmitz with Infernal Archery, same guy. I feel like I probably push him a little bit too. He sees my successes. I see his successes and we're happy for each other at the same time but I still want to beat him by one inch every year. And that's how it is. So um, getting into elk again, I, I was humbled big time. Um, finally, I, I, I bought myself a bow in 2005 was the first year I started bow hunting and I got a little spoiled. I shot uh, probably my biggest rows of elk to date um, with my, in my first year of bow hunting. And I just got lucky. I, I, I completely blew the shot at 12 yards cause I was shaking so hard when he came in, but he was so hot. He came back a second time and, I was able to calm my nerves. And, and after that, you know, things have, now it's just, it's, it's one of those things. I look, obviously like all of us, I look forward to it every year. I can't wait to get out there. Um, the preseason is, is dang near as much fun as the regular season and, and just getting prepared to get out with these guys and, and see if we can, 
can produce. And so, I don't know, it's just, it's just, it's the way of our life. It's what we do. Um, I depend on it. My family depends on it. I mean, that's what we do. We hunt, uh, we try to hunt at least three States per year and, and make it, you know, at least three months of our, of our year as a family. Sweet. Dude, let's back it up. Let's talk about this first elk. You said it was your biggest one to date, but also, also like you screwed it up. You like you shot and missed. At 12 yards. Yeah, I completely. <laughs> I was laughing because I know exact, I know exactly what that's like. I didn't miss on my very first elk. Um, but right before I went on the hunt, everyone's like, whatever you do, don't shoot it in the front shoulder. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Got it. No, no. Whatever <laughs> you do, do not shoot it in the front shoulder. I'm like, yeah, I get it. What did I do? Whap! <laughs> shot it right in the front shoulder <laughs> and i was shaking i had like the big old circles so when oh, you yeah. say you missed at 12 yards i <sighs> my arrow might as well have missed because um i i know what you're talking about right there yeah it was it was silly he come, he came straight in he's by himself uh, i had seen him earlier in the day by himself and had him pretty fired up but couldn't close the deal and he came straight in nothing between him and i i was behind a, a root wad and when I stood up, I was shaking so hard. I was shooting an old Matthew switchback and I was shooting a Matthews, uh, uh, rest as well. And when I drew back, my arrow fell between my rest and my riser. Oh, well, and I'm at full draw going, Oh my gosh. And he doesn't know I'm there. So I tried to do the old flip and rip wheel, flip the, flip the arrow back onto the rest and let go. And when I did that, it launched and took off over his back and landed and did the whole clinkety clinkety thing, you know, and running. And I'm like, Oh my gosh. And I ducked back down as he ran off and I just started chirping subtly while punching myself in the face that I just blown an opportunity like that. And he turned around and came back. He couldn't figure out where it was coming from. He was that fired up. And, and I stood up at 40 and was able to calm down enough to get lucky enough to, to hit him. So, and then it was, Oh my gosh, I've never shaken that hard in my whole life. It was such a, such a cool moment. One of my best friends was with me at the time and he come running out of the brush. He's done. And I'm like, sit down. Let's, let's let him chill out. Cause I've watched too many TV shows where he makes him wait three hours. Uh-huh. When you do it, they're done. They just don't go anywhere. So <clears throat> anyway, it was a cool moment. Um, and I've been trying to beat that bull ever since and haven't yet. So. What did he measure out at? Uh, he's 328 inches. Sweet. He's a good bull. Yeah. That is awesome. So yeah. freaking awesome, man. Corey, that is uh, quite a story. Okay, here's a question for you, elk-related. I've only been hunting elk. uh, Well, shoot, I've only ever hunted elk in September twice. And once was my very first time, and I shot my big bull. And the second time was this last year, but it was dumping rain. And uh, Tony, my hunting partner, he we got on an elk, a little small raghorn 4x4 that had a couple cows with it. And he took a shot, missed short. Um, Two questions. What are these elk doing in the rain? Does it bother them? And then the other thing is, is every time I go out in September, I feel like the only bugles I hear are other hunters. I'm not actually hearing the elk. Are they starting to become more quiet? People always say they are becoming call shy nowadays, but I want to know what your experience is. I have a couple of different opinions and they're probably not right, but they're just mine and they're what, they're what I use. And I actually talked about this the other night with Matt uh, just briefly, but so the rain is, is something that's crazy to me. So if you think about cow elk and their gestation cycles, they're going to go through you know, a several cycles of, of gestation of when they're in season for that bull to come in. And most of these bulls, it, and it's going to depend on when they calved, if they calved early, if they calved late, you know, when did they, um, uh, uh, have their baby so that they can come back into their first cycle and their second cycle. Right. So <clears throat> I believe that when it's warm outside, uh, every, all of the bigger bulls I've ever killed with a bow have been on hot days. Now, a lot of guys will probably disagree with me and say, well, it's quieter when it's raining and it's, you know, I, yeah, I mean, that's your opinion. Mine is I want it hot and I hate hunting in it. It's hotter than hell, but I like it hot because when that cow is urinating and leaving scent, that heat is picking that scent up out of the ground. And typically when there's heat, it's going to swirl. Winds winds are going to swirl a little bit, but it's going to take that scent a lot further than when it rains and it pushes all of the scent into the ground and, and 
and ground temperatures mean scent stays down, mm. right? So if you're cooler ground temperatures, your scent is in the ground. Not that a bull won't come in, but he's just not as hot when there's not a bunch of smell going around. And I don't know, that that's that's what's worked best for me. I know that on a hot day, if I can get on some elk, I'm probably going to find a bull that's hot too, because he's got all these cows um, and it only has to be one cow that's hot. I mean, if one cow is hot, he's going to freak out. He's going to want to fight. So um, it doesn't take all of them. You know, if there's three, better. There'll be more bulls around. But um, yeah, well, I forget. What's the second part of your question? Oh, so, so it was uh, rain and then call shy. Are the elk oh, starting shy. to become more call shy? Um, so I'm like just the- telling you, when it's raining, I never hear them call either. I, it's just one of those deals. They lock it down. And I, again, I, I, I attribute everything to scent. And, and if it's, if they are getting, I mean, shoot, we're dudes. When we were young, you go into a bar, you, whew, you smell a pretty girl with some great perfume on or something. I mean, their scent is an attractant mm-hmm. and it's an attractant through all species. And when that cow is scented up where you want her to be, or she is um, pissing on the ground or pissing on the sand or pissing on the rocks, depending on the kind of country you're in and she's in season, it's going to leave a scent. And when that scent is pulled up with heat and travels, I mean, think of it this way. Um, when you have a bull hit and you're looking for it, and it's been a few days and you don't find it, what are you doing? You're looking for birds and you're smelling because mm-hmm. they get stinky and you're praying for some heat to get them stinky so you can go locate whatever. You drive by anything that was a dead animal, there's a scent. It's no different than when they're in season. If, if there is a scent left behind, that bull is going to fire up. Interesting. Versus the rain. And that's, again, these are my opinions. But that's been my experiences as well. They do not call very well in the rain. Not that they won't. They just don't seem to be as aggressive in the rain. Right. So based off of my hunt this last September, it dumped. It was torrential downpour. And we ran into four elk. They were all together out of five days of or four days of hunting. And that was it. And... Uh, we were tracking them. Seemed like the sign was all about a week old. Some I saw a couple fresh rubs, but that was it. And I was like, okay, maybe I'm just in like a different, a wrong part of the mountain. Um, but, but I was very surprised. I figured that there would at least be something more out there. Um, then again, I don't know. I'm still a rookie hunter, so it's not like I have that much experience to draw from. But that's one of the things that I was like, okay, here I am out ripping lips uh, on a bugle tube out in the woods, and it's just dumping rain. Are they thinking, what the heck's going on with this dude over here? Well, and sound doesn't carry very well either in the rain, right? It gets drowned out real heavily. So you you got to be in much tighter yeah. to get a response. Uh, there's a lot to, though, you know, there, there's rain, which is a front and then there's thunderstorms, which I've always found in thunderstorms, they freak out. I don't know if it's a, and again, I'm not a scientist, but uh, there is something to the barometric pressure stuff too, in my opinion. Yeah. When, uh, so I'm, I'm going into uh, elk hunt in the state of Washington this fall, kind of blind. I got some buddies who are willing to do some scouting for me for a really nice tag. However, I'm a little nervous because I'm like, am I more or less going to be wasting my time? Uh, going after a place that I'll I'll virtually scout, but going to get dropped off more or less. I might not have a car type thing, and it's going to be tromping the woods. Do you, are you a guy who sets up cameras? Are you checking, like, do you know where they're always going to be at a certain time, or is it more like, ah, they're always in this valley, and then I just got to go find them within the valley? I'm not a big camera guy. I mean, I use them here and there, uh, but... I don't use them to find bulls particularly. I use them to make sure the cows to try to figure out um, uh, their cycle. You know, they're so elk or grazers, like deer, deer or browsers, elk or grazers. So they are typically very cyclical where I hunt and I can get into a rhythm or a routine within a day or two of when they're going to be back in most cases. So I do the same thing when I hunt in Oregon. Um, you know, very, very cyclical, usually in Oregon around water because it's Eastern Oregon, but seeing which, where they go. Don't care about what bulls in the area because that bull could be five miles down Canyon in a day. And so if, if there's a bull there now, again, our buddy, Matt, I mean, he's a huge camera guy and has had great success using those cameras and, and would probably attribute a lot of his success to knowing his inventory. I just know the area that I hunt, um, there's already inventory and I really don't care what's there. It, there's going to be something there if I find the cows. Right. And so I look for cows. Um, the cows are going to make it go anyway. So if I stick with them, I'll find a bull at some point. Okay. 
it seems to be a common theme in elk hunting that a lot of people forget is like just hunt the cows. Just you know, we get glorified uh, elk hunting, archery elk hunting gets glorified through like the born and raised outdoors and land of the free series where they're just like, yeah. rrr, 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 and then you know they're blowing these bugles, but really the majority of elk hunting is just getting in close enough to cow call, finding them. Do you like to lay eyes on your on your elk before you're making a move, or is it more like you're you're tracking them down and you're stumbling into them? Um, man, it depends on the moment, right? I mean, you you could hear a bugle you haven't heard before. Maybe you hear a bugle that is similar to the one on, to a bull that you heard saw the day before that you passed on. But even if he's screaming back, doesn't mean there's not another bull in there. It's just not hot enough yet to fight. I I, uh, I usually make my judgment when I see them right then. I don't, but I I will typically you know have a target bull in mind just from, from, again, I don't use a lot of cameras, but I do do a lot of scouting. And so um, if I've got a bull in mind or an area where I've seen a bull within a five to seven mile radius, uh, you know, of a, of a particular valley, then I will, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll put a target on him. But, but if another one comes in, that looks just as sexy, he's going to die too, or at least going to get flung at him at least. Man. So, yeah, you know, so I've mentioned this on the podcast before, this words of wisdom my brother gave me one time when I was having, I was down and out as a college guy, just couldn't get a date. And, you know, I asked out this girl, she said no, and I was really, I was bummed out, man, you know. My brother's like, hey, don't worry about it. Let's say you got a 30% chance a girl's going to say yes. He goes, you ask out 10 girls. You got three that you're going out with you. You ask out 100, you got 30. And I was like, hell yeah, bro. I love that. <laughs> so I like, I always take that when it comes to hunting. It's like, dude, I'd rather shoot my bow or shoot my gun than just carry it all day long and and not, uh, you know, just just look at it. So, yeah, I there's sometimes I understand like holding out for a target animal. And each hunt is different. And I do recommend people hunting their own hunt don't hunt hunts for other people um but i'm the type of dude who's like dude i want to shoot i want to <laughs> i want to send it let's get after this so that's really funny to hear i love that so Corey, you got into uh, elk hunting that's kind of been your big passion within just, well how old are you now you said you started elk hunting at 30 yeah i'm 49 yeah so 19 years yeah. um is it uh, a goal of yours to, well, obviously this is kind of st- silly question. It's always everyone's goal to kill an elk every year. How many elk within those 19 years have you killed? Uh, 16. Wow. And those three yeah. years that you did it, was that a while ago or more recent? Uh, that's been a bit, but you know, I also, um, I'm very picky. Um, they haven't all been Roosevelt's. There's been years in Washington where I haven't had success, but I'll end up getting a one in Montana, um, you know, or Oregon. Uh, last year in Washington, I didn't have success, but I did have success in Oregon. So, um, you know, it's just, it just depends on the year. Uh, we've had years we've been successful in both states, right? So that 16 could be, I, I could have missed a year, but I killed that many bulls. So Dude, that's been lucky. A- I've been very, very lucky. Um, but you got to hunt and, and everybody always says this, and I'm a very picky guy. My friends hate me for it. Um, I'm not, uh, I'm not a send it guy. I'm lucky enough. My wife's a hunter too. My family all hunts. My wife and I have a deal where if I don't get a bull, uh, she'll shoot one during rifle season. We'll get one for her. If I do get one, we tend to shy off on that, especially if we get two. I mean, gosh, dang, it gets to, gets to be a lot. Right. And so you also want to respect it enough to a point. Um, and then we have our, our trips that we like to take every year where it gets, it gets a little, um, overwhelming at times, you know? Um, so we, we've had some success with deer and elk, but for myself, um, you know, my challenge every year is, is I'm, I'm constantly looking for a 300 inch Roosevelt. That's mm-hmm. what I, that's my goal every year. Now that that's a very difficult goal. And I know that, and some years they don't exist. They're just not there. Weather dependent, um, you know, how dry of a spring, what of a spring, uh, when did they calve? Uh, what I've noticed is you were talking about how they just don't seem to be very call, uh, they're, they're seeming to be more call savvy now. Uh, we've noticed a major trend in Washington where it seems like the muzzleloader guys actually get the rut and the bow hunter guys are on the very front end of it. And then the last day of the season, you might hear a bugle. I mean, I've gone entire seasons in the last five years where I haven't heard a bugle. Mm. So I think things have changed a little bit um, from that perspective as well. But 
I, I read an article in East Bend's years ago that kind of ruined me that said, you'll, you'll never kill a trophy if you shoot the first one you see. Yeah. Uh, first out, you got to you know, stick it out. And it's kind of haunted me. Um, uh, but it's also, you know, it's challenged me and makes me want to every year. I'm, I'm going to, that's my goal every year until I can't. Um, and I hope, yeah, again, uh, hopefully I, it'll be a long time before I can't because it is absolutely my passion. You know, I love hearing that. It's such an interesting, what did they say? Eight to 10% of hunters or elk hunters are successful each year. So for you to say, you know, I don't care if it's the state of Washington or you doubled up two in one season or whatever, like that speaks very highly and, and speaks volumes of you as a hunter and your dedication. So average days out in the field a year, because I always, I always like to, I, do you know who Ryan Lampers is? I'm assuming you, you know. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I asked, I asked him one time on a podcast because he kills stuff all the time and he doesn't just kill things. He kills monsters. And I'm like, Ryan, how many days do you give yourself for a hunt? And he goes, well, I don't go on a hunt unless I have minimum seven days, but usually 10. And I'm like, well, there you go. You're bound to like run into something over here. I'm like, hey, can I take a Friday off? And then we'll leave Thursday night. We'll wake up super early, for, you know, and I got to yeah. be back by, uh, by like 8 p.m. on Sunday night, you know. So the weekend warrior makes it tough. How many days of field do you actually spend when you're out chasing elk yearly? Um, in the beginning, I was a weekend warrior or, or you know, I would uh, hunt the evenings. I get off work early, you know, an hour early to go get an extra hour in in the field um, during the week, but hunt the weekends. Uh, now I take the whole season off um, more because uh, the camp I hunt in um, are my, my best friends and we have a great time together and it's, it's more about, the camaraderie in that camp than it is than it is about the hunt. We still we still have some success. We have a great time hunting together. Uh, we all go our own ways. I mean, some of us hunt together here and there, but for the most part, we all leave camp in the morning. And we get back together in the evenings and talk about our day and how much fun we had. And there's just there's there's a lot to that now. Um, I'm I'm to that point in my hunting life where I, I used to be. It sounds like similar to where you are now, where I just wanted to send it. I just want to go kill something, and I still do. I still have a drive to go and harvest a bull, but I have so much fun creating memories with my buddies. I find so much joy when I get the radio call, like bull down. Oh, hell yeah. Let's go. And, um, yeah, it's just, it's just the best. And so I know it's a matter of time before I get my opportunity and I just can't suck in the moment and I'll be fine. <laughs> we'll be too, right? What I have learned and I hope my buddies are listening is it does pay to get your bull early so you're not by yourself after all those guys go home to pack. Right. So we already got one. So, and most of my buddies aren't like that. They'll all show back up, but those that get their bull early, typically we get it out of one load. You know, you yeah. get your bull on the last day. It could be a long ass day. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I have experienced that. I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, okay. So Corey, here you are on your journey. You picked up archery at 30. You're, you're loving it. And then you decided to create an outdoors company, Dead Nuts Outdoors, Archery Targets, 2D, yeah. realistic animals on uh, corrugated plastic yep. to put on a block target or some sort of target. What was your driving force behind uh, creating Dead Nuts Outdoors? Honestly, there wasn't a lot of driving force behind it. We were, uh, um, I work for an incredible company, uh, Pape Group. Um, and we were down in Las Vegas for the con expo and then COVID broke out. And when we flew home, we weren't allowed to go to work for a while. We all had to work from home. Well, the world stopped as we all know. So my son and I, um, I have four boys and, uh, my 17 year old, uh, and my 20 year old, and now my, my 14 year old, we shoot a lot. And we, uh, we own a sign company. We we're like, well, gosh, let's, let's go and, and uh, I'll just hand cut out an elk and we'll start working on realistic stuff. I'm tired of shooting dots. One of our things is stop shooting dots, start hitting spots. And because it's to me, it's very important, especially with my youngest son, um, you know, learning and understanding bone structure, understanding where the V is, how far back can you be and still hit good vitals and, and getting at distance and finding, you know, when that leg's in a funny position or if they're frontal, what's the hole and, and where is the hole to kill it and in teaching that. Um, especially with the YouTube world where there seems like everybody takes a frontal shot. So um, 
<laughs> what the heck? I might as well make a target so people are actually good at it instead of maiming them. Uh-huh. So um, you'd look at guys like Corey Jacobson. I mean, they also take it every time. It's the most lethal shot there is as long as you know what you're doing or what you're looking at. But anyway, uh, we hand cut it and we shot the heck out of it and it was destroyed. Well, I had heard um, that they, I just looked it up on the internet. There was a company that made them and I wanted to buy one. I had no interest in getting into business and um, I tried to order one, but uh, they were out of business. And so I was like, well, gosh, I'll just make one myself. And then it started to evolve. I made another one. We shot it out, made another one and I shot it out. And, you know, my buddies were asking for them and I'm like, well, these things are getting too damn expensive to just shoot them out. So a uh, really great dude, Mike, that works with me. Um, so let's make a kill zone that we can pop in and out. Great idea. So we, we made a replaceable kill zone and then, uh, took it to hunting camp in uh, Oregon and, um, just threw it in the trailer. Well, it got destroyed, you know, getting all ripped up and destroyed the trailer. I'm like, my gosh, we need to figure out a way to package these things. 3D targets are too damn heavy. I hate pulling my arrow out of one. Maybe we have something here. So um, unintentionally, it became a business. Um, we, we began to package it um, in literally one inch boxes that are 30 inches wide by 36 inches tall that you can slide anywhere in your garage and it'll be put away for the winter with no problem. We'll put it right back up. Uh, easy to take with you to camps, kill zones are replaceable. You get lifelike, life-size 2D that mount, because everybody's already got a bag, a block or a bale anyway, that you can mount to it. So my gosh, let's just try it. So we put out our first Facebook ad and sold more than we could produce. So I had to pull everything down because I was like, oh crud, this thing might be something that, uh, and I, I just, I don't want to overpromise and underdeliver. And and we've evolved over time too. We so many of our customers have been so cool in sharing their thoughts. You being one of them uh, on things how we can improve it. Right? We we think it's a pretty cool idea. Um, we like shooting them. But anybody that has an opinion, man, I'm all ears. How can we make it better? How can we make it better? How can we evolve? You know, with what we currently have, we'll evolve into more game in time. But I mean, my goodness, people want elk and they want deer. 99% of the time. Right. Yeah. And so that's what we've focused on and, and, uh, and it's evolved and you're coming up pretty quick. We're going to, we're going to take the leash off the dog and just let it go. Cause we've, we've held it back um, just so we don't again, over promise and under deliver, but it's time. And we've got, we've got the processes down to a point now where we can actually produce enough to let it go. So yeah, it's uh, great. Beautiful. Well, your targets are gorgeous. Um, where, where do you get your pictures at for these animals? Uh, I buy them. Yeah. I, buy, I can't take credit for taking the photos myself. I, I bought the photos, um, uh, and about the licensing rights to them. And, and, right. and, uh, well, we use as high, as high res as you can, because the further you get away, you can actually start to pick out every one of our, our targets. You can actually find bone structure. You can see scapula, you, you can see elbow, you can see everything. So. Yeah. Super important. Your, uh, dude, these pictures I'm looking on your, I'm on your website right now. Deadnutsoutdoors.com. Dude, that white tail is a monster. And then that mule deer, holy <laughs> smokes. <laughs> yeah. That, that the quartering away mule deer is, is my favorite target to shoot. He, he narrows your, your zone down. You got to hit off side shoulder and really focus on it. And I think if I would have put a fork and horn buck in there, no one would buy the damn thing. So we've had guys uh, buy our entire deal, buy, buy every one of our targets and put them in their yard to not shoot them. They just think they look cool. So <laughs> that was a, a dude in Redmond, Oregon came and told me that. It was pretty cool. That's awesome. Well, I just recently got your black bear. And if anyone has listened to this podcast before, you know how much of a bear fanatic I am. And my goal is to actually arrow a black bear. So um, oh, cool. <laughs> One of these days, I'm going to get an opportunity. Although I moved, it could to happen s- on your elk hunt this year. It, you know what? It sure could. I didn't even think about that. I'd totally send an arrow on a bear on my elk hunt this year. <laughs> I, I would. Awesome. I don't. Everyone's like, "Oh, dude, a bear! I'm never going to waste a hunt on a bear or something like that." It's like, I don't know, man. I love them, especially if you get a color phase, which is a really big blocky head. It's like, yeah, let's go. <laughs> Um, yeah, your targets are sweet. Absolutely love them. Uh, for listeners who have like, you're hearing us talk about these targets, but don't really understand how they work. So it is plastic, corrugated plastic, like cardboard, only plastic. How do you attach it to a target? What, or what what are you doing to support it? 
so we have a hanging tab that's that's installed um, uh, where we manufacture them. And that hanging tab is centered perfectly over the center of the kill zone so that your kill zone is always centered just in front of your backstop. And you can hang that hanging tab either vertically or over the top of your block and you mount it um, over the top of your block and your kill zone and your, and your target will fit flush up against your block or your bag. So it's mounted, it's mounted perfectly. Uh, the guys in the East Coast, especially in Wisconsin, the guys that are running round bales, um, if they're looking to get the, they buy a lot of the elk back there. And if they're looking to get the, the elk to its normal height, then they'll hang that uh, hanging tab vertically and mount it directly into a hay bale to get the elk to stand taller. Uh-huh. Um, so, and same with deer, but it just depends on what you're adhering it to. If you're adhering it to a bag or a block, it's real easy just to, to take that hanging tab. Uh, you'll see it right on the back, right above the kill zone and, and adhere it to the top. Um, if you're putting it on a bale, uh, especially a round bale, um, you're going to hang them vertically, the tabs. I love how your targets come with two kill zones, one and one that makes up the target, but then uh, also a replacement. How how many replacement kill zones are you selling, like, or, or return sales from people who have bought the target and are already going through those kill zones? Yeah, we're just starting to see that. Um, we haven't been at it that long. So, uh, we're just starting to see customers calling back for we we when they buy them we see people buying two and three different packs. The point in this target is to make it affordable. Um, you know we want realistic shot opportunities on realistic looking animals that are life size or really close to life size. Well, we how we judge our life size too is top of the back to bottom of the brisket. So for example, on our our broadside bull elk, you know a, a mature bull is going to be anywhere twenty eight to thirty four inches between the back and the and the uh, the chest, and I think we run them at thirty or thirty one. Mm-hmm. Um, so we try to get it as close as we can. Depends on the size of the bull you're shooting as to how big or how broad they are. Same with a buck, but um, we sell, like you said, with one extra kills on the box. So there'll be two in the in your initial package. Uh, they should take between two and four hundred shots for the shot out. But that's all dependent upon what your eye sees. Like if you're looking, because um, you're going to be able to see it once you start to smash the kills on several times, you'll start to see a hole for them. But as you get, you know, if you start wanting to dial in again, just go pop a new one in there. They're, they're hard to destroy. Um, we sell the second kill zones uh, in two packs for $19 on our website to try to keep it very affordable, to try and encourage people to shoot a lot and shoot um, and, and understand. You, you can go shoot dots, especially if you're a target archer, obviously. But if you're looking for lifelike, um, uh, you need to be shooting these targets for sure. We keep them affordable, as, as we all know. A 3D uh, bull elk is going to be in that, you know, fifteen hundred to two thousand dollar range, depending on, on the quality in which you buy. And these targets are one hundred and fifty nine dollars, and and they weigh all of about two pounds, and you can put them away and take them wherever you want. So right. Trying to keep them very affordable, and you can keep it to where in the winter time they don't take up a lot of space, and they're not hard to pull arrows out of. I mean, there's a lot of advantages to it other than just the cost. Yeah, I I love it. Um, the biggest my biggest issue when it comes to this and not to knock it because it is what it is, is that if it's windy and if your target isn't in a place where you can shoot uh, with the wind, because you're, you're going to be facing that or, you know, uh, an issue with that. um, What type of recommendations do you have for people on that? Just, it is what it is and try to set up your target. So it's not going to catch it and be a big sale. Yeah. I mean, and that, especially with the broadside bull, that's been the biggest uh, issue. If it's, if there's an issue, we've had guys that are adhering them differently to where they are protecting them. Um, for us, <clears throat> we've gone with bigger stabilizer strips now so that the, that the, the, where the package, where the target folds up, the stabilizers are much stronger now than they've ever been. So we aren't seeing them prematurely fold in, in wind, but the hanging tab is designed for that thing to flip in the air so that the target doesn't get the hell beat out of it mm-hmm. in wind, doesn't fold up and doesn't crumble. Um, We've, we've been reinforced like the frontal bull elk based off of a customer um, uh, response. Uh, we've reinforced antlers where, gosh, dang it, we didn't even realize there was a weak spot there. And then they, we fixed that. And, and then, you know, if you've ordered a frontal elk and we haven't sent you that reinforcement, please call us or email us and we'll send you one. We want them to be right. We want you guys to be right because it, it was a great, great comment. But um, mostly, I mean, you're going to have to protect it the best you can. They are, you know, they are plastic and they're solid and, they're going to, and they're, and they're hanging 
from an existing backstop. So the wind is difficult. Now you also have the option if you want to, um, I've done it myself. Like if you, if you're depending on just the hanging tab and you don't want it to flap around in the wind adhere it with a screw or something through the bottom, if you want to, you're not going to hit there probably with your arrow anyway. Right? <laughs> you hope not. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, if you do, you're, you know, put it in a spot where if you do, you deserve to lose an arrow, <laughs> but you know, uh, we've, I've done it myself. I mean, it, I get it. again, uh, when we first came out with them uh, a year ago, uh, a lot of our targets were on black material. We ended up in a Tamarack at the Northwest Mountain Challenge shoot, and it was really hot. And we learned that that the black material would cup up a little bit in direct sunlight because of heat. Mm-hmm. And you go the black material versus the white material, like oh my gosh! So it would it would snap right back when it would cool off at night. But we can't have that, especially with as many targets as we sell in Texas in the Midwest. Right. Like that's not gonna work. Right. So we changed that too. So. We are evolving. Uh, we want them to be great. We are open to suggestions. Um, uh, and if, and again, especially if you have one uh, that we need to make an improvement upon it, uh, we'll make the improvement and send you the components to better yours as well. So. I love it. Uh, one of the things is because you use such high quality imagery on your targets, I I haven't thought about putting a screw or a nail or whatever into the target oh. to hold it down in different areas because I'm like, it's so nice. I don't want to put another hole in it. Um, so that makes sense. Question is, how many shots will you put with a broadhead on your target? Or are you kind of like hold that question. out for like uh, right before I go hunting? Or what do you do? Honestly, um, that is a, that's a bigger problem, broadheads. Uh, it's, it's per- the target is perfect for field points. Uh, and you can shoot broadheads through it. But if you're shooting a three-blade or a four-blade broadhead, right, that's how many more cuts you're putting in it. And when you're pulling your broadhead out, it's got to be lined up perfectly or you're not going to pull it out of there, right? Because you're slicing. It's not like the foam that's going to cut on the way in and out. This thing is going to block because the back of your broadhead is not sharp. Yeah. Right. So it's going to, you have to line it up just perfectly. What we tell a lot of people is, is when you are ready to shoot your broadheads and you're looking for bone structure, pop the kill zone out. Mm. The, the kill, you can still see the bone structure. Just pull the kill zone out and shoot your block. Shoot into the hole. You can still see the breakout of the body and exactly where you're supposed to be. Work on that. That's instead of so, <laughs> so simple and yet i'm like oh duh that yeah. makes sense <laughs> we, we like to pull the kill zones out when we're when we're teaching youth so that we can especially um for example the the quartering away mule deer you can see the uh offside shoulder or the offside leg um we wanted to really focus on that so we'll we'll pull the kill zone out and show them the bone structure of the front front leg uh the side that's facing you and see how that's that's forward if you go through this back, you know, depending on your angles, this is where you're going to hit most vitals. Mm. So uh, coming up here real soon, we've had a number of uh, requests for ASA scores inside our kill zones. Um, and so we will be tracing in some scoring zones because there's uh, some archery ranges that are using these targets now. Cool. Um, inexpensive ways for them to not have to use their 3Ds inside their archery ranges. So we'll just, they can just, after every shoot, they can just pop in a new kill zone and with ASA scores on them. Yeah, I love that. Um, local ar- archer shop down here. I'm going to have to introduce your targets to them. Are you oh, cool. are you starting you. to uh, get in stores at all? Yeah, so we've, we've been very hesitant on that. We receive a lot of dealer requests. And, and if you're a dealer that's listening to this, thank you for requesting. And we will be doing that uh, heavily very soon. Uh, we're currently in, in uh, uh, with three people currently. Um, Universal Outdoor Products, Archery World, um, four locations, and um, um, uh, Dead On Archery in Boise. Nice. Sorry about that. No. Uh, so Dead On, yeah, with TJ, he's awesome. And so just kind of, and TJ really helped me out with pricing structures and learning the game, right? I'm, I'm not in this game. I'm not in the outdoor world. Um, you know, it's, it's great. It's one thing I do love about our industry is how helpful everybody is. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we want to make sure if, if you're going to be a dealer that you get to make money at it. Uh, but we need to make money too. So we're, <laughs> we're trying to make sure that it works, right? Not just direct to consumer. Um, but it, it does work. Uh, the inflation doesn't help, but it does work. And <laughs> right. we, we expect to uh, be in more stores uh, starting in 23. Man, I love it. I just got my very first 3D target. Um, what was it? About a week ago, a Glendale buck, you know, just like oh, yeah. classic, classic Glendale. I've always wanted a 3D target to shoot. And 
I put out your 2D target next to it, and I'm just like, dude, I'd way rather just it, it was a windy day, so I had to pull down the 2D target, but I was like, dude, I'd way rather shoot at this and shoot into a block every time uh than just destroy the the 3D target because just because of what it is. Um also I'm just I wanted to make a comment about broadheads on your on your target. Dude, I don't know if this is a good thing or bad thing, but Matt Schmidt, Schmitty, he built my first arrows, and he likes to hot melt everything with his inserts rather than super glue. I don't know if you are are you a super glue or a hot melt guy? Well, he does all my arrows, so I'm a hot melt. Okay, so there you go. So, so I would pull arrow broadheads out of blocks, and I'd be losing my broadheads or inserts inside the block because the hot melt, like on a hot day, would get a little soft and I was like doggone it so I ended up I actually push my broadheads all the way through my targets unscrew them pull them out and screw them back in I'm like I don't know if this is <laughs> I'm not We're throwing Schmitty now, under the bus warm. oh yeah very warm dude it hasn't been under 100 like in, in 10 days or something like that it's whew. It's, <laughs> it's nice it's nice to get away from that P&W rain but uh the concept of public land, dude, people don't realize how special public land is to be like, hey, I'm just going to go take a hike or ride a bike or go pick mushrooms or go hunting or go look for animals. Um, because down here, I'm like, dude, I don't, where do I even go shoot a gun at? You know, I got to go pay money to, to go shoot a gun or do different things like that. So, a little shout out to all you people who access public land. Don't take things for granted because when they're gone, you're going to miss them a tremendous amount. So, hmm. yeah, a little, little piece of advice right there that I'm a lot of people are always like East Coast, Midwest, heading out west to go. Like, oh, I want to learn Western hunting. Here I am. I'm going Western hunting to back east. And everyone's like looking at me cross eyed, like, what's what is this dude doing? You've got it all backwards. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you try living in Washington State. You you got it right. Oh, ain't that the truth? Uh, what do you got going on for the future? What, you got any special hunts you got lined up for this year? Draw any special tags or anything <sighs> like that? I got my butt kicked this year. Yeah. So um, my goal was to to not even hunt Washington. Honestly, it was to extend my season by getting a muzzleloader tag and using my bow in Washington because I was going to be too busy in three other states. And I I went over. I'd had a rough rough year. Um, Oregon went to a draw system for the first time ever, uh, for archery and I didn't draw. So, so I don't even get to go to Oregon. So all, you know, it's, it's, it's so frustrating. The only tag that I did draw that I am pretty excited. I've, I've never shot an antelope, uh, with a rifle or a bow. And I am heading to Montana, uh, being beginning of September with my bow to, to try and stick a speed goat. So it'll be pretty cool. I'm pretty excited about that. That'll be well, uh, if you check the website, there'll probably be an antelope target coming up because I got to make one for me. So <laughs> you'll be able to find them. And, uh, you know, a lot of our targets, too, uh, we can be seconded as decoys. And so there will be um, – we make we make turkey decoys. We're, we're dabbling. We had our, our demos out last year with turkey deeks um, uh, that we sent some out. We had a lot of success with them. And then also with silhouette uh, waterfowl stuff. So we're dabbling. We're dabbling in some other things. I mean – the silhouette waterfowl thing is there's a lot of people already doing it. Um, you know, I'm not someone who just wants to jump on the copy wagon. Um, if I can be different, we'll push it. Um, if I'm just going to be the same thing at a different price, I'm probably gonna, not going to push that too hard. We'll see where we're at. We end up with that. But on the turkey side, those things were really cool. And you'll probably see those debuting at first of the year as, as a product that we're going to push. Sweet. They, they were lightweight and easy and they worked awesome. Dude, the videos of people hunting turkeys in like open fields and hiding behind a tom and a fan and they just like walk all the way up to the turkey. I got to try that at some point. That is incredible. But you're I'm looking at your tom turkey frontal target right now and I'm like, "Oh yeah, I could totally hide behind that." Yeah, well, and that's not even one of the decoys. That's actually just a target. I mean, our decoys are are not toms, they're jakes and hens and uh I mean, they turned out really cool. We were pretty happy. I'll shoot you some pics later, but uh, they were pretty cool. They were they worked really really well. So I love it. Um, Corey, how can people find you? How can they uh, go check out all of that you got going on? 
Yeah, please. Uh, it's at uh, www.deadnutsoutdoors.com. Uh, a lot of new stuff coming up. So I'm excited. I'm getting really excited for this thing to really pop. So. Awesome. I'll make sure the link uh, to uh, Dead Nuts Outdoors is in the show notes as well. And can people follow along? Are you on uh, Instagram, Facebook, or anything like that? Do you? Yeah, we're on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, I needed to be better. So I'll be better. I'll be better. <laughs> Johnny Mac, my hero. So I'll be better. Um, he's going to teach me as soon as we get off here on how to be better. So we'll, yeah, the bed. Yeah, we're on Facebook, Dead Nuts Outdoors, and on Instagram at deadnuts.outdoors. I love it. I love it. Corey, thank you so much for coming on, sharing your knowledge. I, it, I'm sitting here and being like, okay, okay, check, check. I got to take notes and, and apply it for my elk hunt this coming fall. I really appreciate it, brother. Thank you for joining Thanks us. For me, John. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Listeners, go check out deadnutsoutdoors.com. Excuse me. Wow, just uh, a little a little burp in the microphone. Deadnutsoutdoors.com. Pick yourself up a 2D target. Support local hunters uh, like Corey. And, uh, you know, get after it. Have fun. Let me know what you think of it. Uh, shoot some pictures. Tag us in Soulful Hunter on social media. And remember that hunting has the power to transform lives through primal adventure. Be blessed, everybody. Mentorship is conservation. Freedom on. And stay soulful. If you enjoyed today's podcast, I'd love it if you could go ahead and give this a rating as well as subscribe. Also, you can check us out on Instagram under the Soulful Hunter podcast. Make sure to tag us in pictures and posts and use the hashtag Soulful Hunter. To find out more about the Soulful Hunter podcast, go to soulfulhunter.com and be sure to follow the podcast as we are going to be bringing you a lot of great information, insight, and changing lives through Primal Adventure. I look forward to connecting with you on the next episode. Stay tuned and stay soulful. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Johnny Mac here. Just wanted to give you a heads up that if you are looking for a community that is open to discussion as far as mentorship, conservation, the wild, becoming a better person, and all of that, there is a group for you on Facebook, and it is called Soul Seekers. Soul Seekers, we are all about making ourselves a better person. We're all about making sure hunting lasts for generations to come and encouraging people to get plugged in, whether you are someone who has something to give or someone who needs to soak it up like a sponge, this is a community for you, and I encourage you, I strongly encourage you that if you're on Facebook to join Soul Seekers, and if you're not on Facebook, hop on there just for that group. It is only going to be as powerful as we all make it, and so just remember that life happens for you, it doesn't happen to you, and that you can't outgive good. You can't outgive good people. I want you to understand that and I want you to believe it because when we believe that and we lead with courage and we lead with intention, lives are changed, lives are transformed, just like on this podcast, Transformation Through Primal Adventure. Be blessed. Enjoy this episode. Talk soon.